Our case presentation for today is 78-year-old male uh, underwent chest CT as a follow-up of accidentally discovered lower limb, uh, lower uh, lobe uh, uh, node uh, during uh, the COVID infection since Jan uh, 2000, uh, 2022. Um, his medical history is the three-pack year smoking history. He quit uh, 30 years ago and um, uh, those are the parameter of the uh, lung function. New chest CT in August um, develop a new uh, 2.8 centimeter mass in the superior uh, right uh, lower loop with a stable of the uh, follow-up uh, previous notes that we discovered uh, during the COVID. So um, this is the uh, picture of the uh, chest CT. We have right lower loop uh, as I suffered recess. Uh, mass 2.5 centimeter abutting the right main stem bronchus uh, with no lymphadenopathy. Tissue diagnosis and staging, we have flexible uh, bronchoscope uh, with, with the flexible bronchoscopy, uh, no endobrachial uh, tumor seen, uh, ABUS for mediastinal staging uh, showed no enlarged lymph nodes. And uh, we take uh, a biopsy and the pathology revealed a poorly differentiated non-small cell and cancer, uh, favorite squamous cell carcinoma. So our patient treatment, what would you recommend? Offer right lower loop superior segmentectomy by thoracic surgeon or repeat the bronchoscope again or refer the patients to have a radiotherapy by SBRT technique? We can uh... think. I think. I think both the first, the first and last choices are to. I, okay. I think both um, the first and last choices should be uh, discussed. Um, this is a non-metastatic, non-small cell lung cancer, peripheral lesion. It's uh, not peripheral. Uh, uh, Super central. <laughs> sorry. So. Non-metastatic, not negative, uh, non-small cell lung cancer, squamous cell carcinoma. This is for local treatment. I think surgery, uh, if feasible, represents the standard of treatment up till now. But stereotactic body radiotherapy is, is uh, a good alternative. Yeah. Dr. Rashid. Uh, My own opinion, if the patient is refusing surgery, it is better to do radical radiation therapy. Uh, the, the another comment is, uh, is the, especially squamous cell carcinoma, uh, do we need to do the panel of mutation for him? This is uh, for discussion also. Yeah. Um, your patient is 78 years old. I would actually go consider highly SBRT okay. for that patient. Okay. Any other opinion? Uh, the patients uh, require preoperative assessment uh, as uh, spirometry and delico uh, as regard the chest uh, and uh, control chest condition and uh, may consult thoracic surgery. It's resectable. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So the patient, uh, um, uh, our patient, uh, we, we decided to uh, refer him for uh, to have the um, uh, SBRT, radiotherapy SBRT, and we will discuss why why this decision is. Uh, uh, is there. So the evidence on uh, the treatment of stage one non-small cell lung cancer, the uh, either by stereotactic uh, body radiotherapy for early non-metastatic, um, the standard is lobectomy with systemic mediastinal lymph node, as Dr. Hamad mentioned, and remains the recommended treatment. This is the standard treatment to go for surgery in any lung cancer. This is the standard of the treatment and the best that we can do. So, um, uh, sublobar resection may be considered in, in uh, selected uh, patients with, uh, with the special uh, criteria. On the other hand, 
um, if we also look to the high operative risk patients, and we will go through how to assess the risk of the patients during the operation, this is the main stone of uh, such a debate. How do we say that this patient is highly operative risk or not? This, the, the, you will direct the patients upon that. So the patient should be informed that while SPRT may have uh, addressed risk from the treatment in the short term, uh, the longer term outcome increases the three year, uh, not well established in this case, we will uh, go for SPRT. So um, if we come to the um, latest version of the NCCN, we will find here that um, in the stage 1A, negative lymph nodes, uh, medically inoperable, but it's not only medical inoperable, but also high risk uh, operable. We, we have uh, uh, an evidence here to uh, go for radiotherapy, particularly for SPRT. Again here in, sorry. Here in stage one, sorry. Okay, in stage one central, this is our case that we uh, we're going to discuss uh, with no negative, medically inoperable, uh, we can offer uh, definitive radiotherapy with uh, SPRT. So here the definition of the operable patients. Um, I found this um, table on uh, one of our colleagues' uh, slides from last uh, uh, astro meeting in US and it's very, very nice slide really. So uh, we have a population of a standard operable risk or high risk operable, medically inoperable and medically untreatable. So the, and the extent of tolerability here adjusted which approach that we can offer for the patients for his, uh, uh, to limit the, the tumor and also to preserve his quality of life. So the standard operable depends on the um, typical described here according to the uh, plenty of uh, pulmonary function tests and general conditions. We offer him lobectomy or pneumonectomy in high risk uh, sublobar section or ablative therapy uh, in such a context here. And medically inoperable, we can use the ablative therapy uh, or single agent chemo. And medically untreatable, uh, we have the uh, best supportive care for those patients. This is a, a very sophisticated diagram. I think the, this is for surgeons. And uh, if we have a surgeon colleague, he can just go through it. But at the end uh, of all uh, these investigations and criteria, setting the criteria, also, we will stratify the patients into low risk for operation, moderate risk to be operable, and high risk to be operable. And this is very crucial. How, how can we direct those patients? How, how can I assess those, this patient is uh, fitted for surgery or uh, play it safe and send it for uh, radiotherapy? And I'm sure if, uh... Okay. So coming to the uh, SPRT, just to know what's SPRT. Um, the SPRT stands for stereotactic body radiotherapy. Uh, it's most used to refer to uh, any course of ultra hypofractionation. SPRT considered to be any treatment regimen above five gray per fraction. If you find that we give five gray or more per fraction. So this is what we call in radiotherapy uh, community ultra hypo. It's not just hypo, it's ultra hypo uh, with a specific biological and physics constraints. SPRT stands for stereotactic ablative radiotherapy. Those nowadays we say SABR. So if you just find it in the literature, SBRT or SABR, they find that Stereotactic ablative radiotherapy is much more accurate term than SPRT. Um, how can we deliver SPRT? We can deliver it through X knife. This is Lenac base. So any any center that have a, a, a linear with what we call triple F 
uh, uh, mood, we can uh, uh, adjust it to have an SPRT safely. Also, the Cyper Knife SPRT, we now have a Cyper Knife in 57357. Um, Cyper Knife can also offer us an SPRT. Gamma Knife can offer SRS and SPRT, but only for the brain tumors. Evidence based to use the SPRT for only those um, um, uh, organs. Uh, we can use it for the brain, lung, liver, pancreas, kidney, and spine. Those only organs that we have a, a committed and solid evidence regarding the dose, the constraints, the maneuver, the techniques to uh, deliver safe SPRT. So come to our case, I just want to quickly, just to give you an idea how me uh, as a radiation oncologist, just uh, designing the, the radiotherapy for such a case. So we will go through some definitions to share it with you. Uh, what is the central? Uh, we, we define it the, the, the tumors of the lung either central, ultra-central, and peripheral. So the central disease, we have two common definitions for me. I go for the RTOZ0813. Uh, it is the tumor within or touching the zone of the proximal pulmonary tree, or if we designing my PTV, will touch the mid pleura or pericardium. In this case, I will consider it as a central disease. So what's ultra-central? Nowadays, um, the literature is, and the publications are discriminating between central and ultra-central. So ultra-central is simply the central plus um, GTV that abut the proximal pulmonary tree, ITV that abuts the proximal bronchial pulmonary tree, or even the PTV. Very simply, uh, when I just uh, tell my residents, they always say, so how we, we cannot uh, just des they describe what's central, ultra central. I just say it crudely that whenever you are abutting or touching a serial organ like uh, spinal cord, esophagus, you here are ultra central. Central bronchial or uh, the bronchopulmonary tree, any serial organs, hollow organ, so you are in the ultra center uh, uh, space. So, um, in a stereotactic body radiotherapy for ultracentral uh, lung uh, tumor, a feasible option, uh, uh, is it a, a feasible safe option? Yes, uh, review articles and many publications that you can go through that um, uh, uh, prove that the local control and overall survival is the same as surgery and also safe, but still, we, if, you, if you don't uh, uh, design it well and deliver it in a proper way with the high QA and high cautious and the high uh, stratification of your patient, whether it is central, ultra-central, peripheral, you will face a grade 3 uh, toxicity, which could be fatal. So here, uh, just to let you know that uh, SPRT is not... Uh, the uh, good option for everybody if we if we come here for this algorithm which is very very useful uh, if we had a mass less than five centimeters ptv overlaps those hollow organs like spinal brachial plexus esophagus and trachea so this is not for sprt so what's what what should i do in such a case in this case i will go for normal hypofractionation Okay, just two slides, please. I will go for normal hypofractionation or just the conventional normal fractionation. Okay, and this is the details when, when it is yes for Cyper. Even inside the Cyper, we sometimes um, choose the 60 in five fractions, sometimes 48 in three fractions, and all uh, 60 in, in eight fractions. And every fraction has its own criteria depending on the size of the tumor, the condition of the patients, and also the geography of the tumor itself. I will go very quickly. This is the, just to, the, the, the doses to let you know. Um, for me, uh, when it's, if, if, if I'm going to treat these patients, I will go for 7.5. Uh, in eight fraction to play it safe uh, because the 18 plus three uh, carry out uh, 
uh, biological uh, effective dose very high. So um, again, the, um, the evidence for uh, having a surgery in such a case is we have 172 manuscripts comparing SBRT and surgery for early non-small cell lung cancer, and 95 manuscripts include in guidelines, zero manuscripts by surgeons supporting the use of SBRT, as you always, and zero manuscripts by radiation oncologists supporting the use of surgery, of course. So um, this fight will, it's endless, and we will keep that. But again, I, I'm, I'm here just to assure you that the best option ever is the safe uh, for the patients. We have to assess the operability very, very crucially. Again, we should choose our constraints and carry out the geography of the tumor and designing the proper plan for him. Either or we can harm or either or we can save these patients. So the multidisciplinary approach is very, very important in, in such a context for treating those patients, high-risk patient tolerated minimally invasive surgery. Uh, better than uh, open pathological stage, including mediastinal lymph nodes evaluation, is beneficial for the resection, of course. Central SBRT uh, is a very viable option, especially when considered uh, against uh, surgical risks and longer follow up and larger number needed, of course. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor uh, Sohab. I have just one question. You you mentioned that the, the standard um, dose may be 18 gray and three fractions. No you, standard. <laughs> you mentioned in, according to UK. Uh, yeah, those are it's. Uh, I'll I'll bring the slide again, but it is it is not a standard. It's it's long long story. I just brief here. Okay, so, so we have a standard 18 plus fraction yes. uh, or. The conservative dose, if you can uh, have it uh, much safer and, and much biological, we, you can. You can a little slide. But do you think that this 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 dose is, is sufficient for such a tumor? I mean, you have to escalate the dose beyond no, no, the maybe thirty-six. No, this is very very high dose. The um, the dose uh, eighteen uh, plus, uh, per uh, eighteen in three fractions is higher biologically than you give seven point five in eight. Seven point five in eight is the cooler one but um because because we are dealing with sprt that's why yes of course you yeah. are afraid of hemorrhage of course i understand this but uh, i mean the, that uh, yes, the ultra it is dose. Yeah. yes i think it's we have to scale it beyond um, maybe 36 gray no in ultra central you can do that you, you are afraid no. of hemorrhage no no the, 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 you, you don't have to do that because you just want to ablate this tumor and no harm and no grade three. If I just escalated yes. more, I will go for grade three. I will get nothing. I, oh. I, I will cost him a huge side effect, huge side effect. Therefore, the surgery is the standard line of care in yes, such a tumor. I do agree. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Can we, can we invite uh, Dr. Sahar, next speaker? Head of Clinical Oncology Department, Egypt Air Hospital. She will talk about uh, from literature to practice, advanced non-small cell lung cancer case presentation. Welcome. Thank you. Um, good morning. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Inshams University on College Department for the kind invitation. طبعاً قسم الأورام عينشامس بتشرف إن أنا بنتمي لي مدرستي وبيتي الأول. My topic today will be about uh, from literature to practice, advanced non-small cell lung cancer case presentation with actionable mutation. Okay, um, our case, 70, 71 years old female patient, never a smoker, with a past history of hypothyroidism and on replacement therapy, l with a good performance status one, otherwise her, uh, her history is irrelevant. 
Okay, the patient um, uh, has a history four years ago uh, in July 2018. Uh, her first complaint started as a desnia and the hemopsis, and CT chest at that time showed left upper lobe mass uh, around 8 times 7 times 4 centimeter, invading the visceral pleura, mediastinal, and the coastal parietal pleura, with attenuation of the upper lobe bronchus, as we can see. This is the lesion. This is the lesion. And the CT guided core biopsy uh, showed bronchogenic adenocarcinoma grade 2. PET CT at that time showed same pre mentioned mass with significant SUV. Uh, with active prevascular and left hilar lymph node, the largest one centimeter, with significant SUV, 3.8. And according to the NCCN guideline, we should confirm or exclude the mediastinal lymph node. And so the patient, uh, and so the patient to go for uh, uh, doing bronchoscopy and the mediastinoscopy, which showed positive left hilar lymph node and the negative mediastinal lymph node, uh, which done in USA. Uh, and the MRI brain at that time with contrast was unremarkable. So the stage, the clinical stage, was T4N1M node, stage 3A. The patient did also comprehensive genetic testing uh, in USA, uh, which showed uh, EGFR exon 21 point mutation positive. Other molecular uh, profile was negative. BDL1 was positive with TBS scoring 15%. So, the question now to our dear panelists uh, for this case at that time, four years ago, uh, shall we go for upfront surgery or uh, giving uh, concurrent chemo radiation or uh, induction or neoadjuvant chemotherapy or definitive chemo radiation therapy? My own recommendation is to give targeted therapy for this patient, either gefitinib uh, or zoglaparib. Uh, she has mutation. Uh, still, still stage 3A, and at that time, uh, 2018, not approved yet uh, in the early stage, so only in the advanced is, stage. So it is better to go for new adjuvant chemotherapy induction than uh, radical radiation therapy, or new adjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery, as you like. Other opinion? Actually, um, all options uh, are of concern. And this patient should be discussed in a multidisciplinary team, should have our surgeon. Upfront surgery may, may be feasible. Uh, the surgeon may ask for new adjuvant chemotherapy to reduce the infiltration of the surroundings, the T4 uh, extension. Um, for me, as a clinical oncologist, may I prefer concurrent chemo radiation? Um, Dr. Asha uh, advised uh, gefitinib or uh, any anti-EGFR, actually it is approved in stage 4, but we have some phase 2 studies about concurrent radiation with anti-EGFR, I think published uh, 2 or 3 years ago. Um, so all options uh, should be uh, discussed. For me, I will give uh, concurrent chemo radiation. So, what's your uh, the performance status of the patient? This, uh, this is something very important to know. Yes. It was one? One, yes. So, if the patient can go for surgery, I would tend to go for neoadjuvant chemotherapy and then surgery for that patient. And then after the surgery, now in 2022, then you can give the adjuvant treatment followed by ozumertinib, the ADORA trial. I'm not aware in that you can give neoadjuvant ozumertinib. Uh, for for now, even now, for EGFR mutant patients, uh, but I would stick to the standard, especially for EGFR mutant patients, their response to chemotherapy is excellent. So you're expecting to really have a great response for those patients. And it really depends if you have a great thoracic surgeon, uh, oncothoracic surgeon or not. Still the patient in USA. This is ah, the decision. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's interesting to know where their decision is. Okay.
صح هو ريجاردلس انا عارف الحاله بس طبعا دكتور شريف اوكي بات يور تشويس ايذر تو اور فور مي بي ذا سيم ديفينيشن كونكرنت اور ديفينيتيف كيمو راديشن ايش معنى يعني ايه ايه الفرق ايه شويه قصدك ان هتعملي اندكشن وبعدين هتدي تدي كونكرنت ذا لاست اوبشن ديفينيتيف ويز اوت سيرجري بس ذا اذر اوبشن تو بي فولد باي سيرج اه يعني اوكي يعني انت هتدي سمولر دوز اوف راديشن يس راديشن اوكي سو اي ثينك ذات نيو ادجوانت كيموثيرابي ايذر فولد باي كونكرنت كيمو راديشن اور باي سيرجري اولذو اتس ستيج 3 3 اي 3 اي يس So uh, maybe new adjuvant chemotherapy is the wise um, decision, and uh, we can uh, check for the response thereafter. Okay. Yeah, so exactly. One of two options: De definitive chemo radiotherapy uh, in a definitive dose of radiotherapy or surgery. And the role of anti-EGFR is only if the patient underwent surgery. Otherwise, the role of new adjuvant up to this moment only after uh, surgery as adjuvant in in three A. Okay, exactly. And according to the NCCN guideline, all options are valid. Uh, I either uh, surgery, upfront surgery with the preferred option, or the concurrent chemo radiation to be followed by surgery, or even induction chemotherapy to, to, be, uh, to be followed by surgery. So the decision is still in USA to uh, proceed for induction chemotherapy in the form of pemetrexid carboplatin. Uh, to be followed by surgery, and the patient received already uh, four cycles of pemetrexid carboplatin with a good tolerability, and the CT chest showed partial response. Uh, the patient underwent the surgery in Egypt in February 2019 uh, with the left upper lobectomy, hyalur, and mediastinal lymph node sampling, and the pathology revealed adenocarcinoma grade 2 with hyalur lymph node positive 3 over 3 and the aortopulmonary lymph node and subcranial lymph node negative. The post-operative CT chest uh, showed the clear operative bed with no abnormalities uh, detected. So the next question uh, is, is there a rule for adjuvant chemotherapy after induction? And the second question, is there a rule for adjuvant uh, Ozemertinib in this case, or even Atezo in this case. Remember the case uh, treated in 20, 2018. And uh, the approval of uh, Ozemertinib and Atezo uh, recently in 2020. So uh, suppose uh, the approval was uh, 2018. Would you treat uh, this case with uh, adjuvant Ozemertinib or Atezo? We'll tell you. Um First question, is there a role for adjuvant chemotherapy after induction? The answer is no. And is there a role for adjuvant ozimertinib in this case? Uh, if we're talking 2022, the Adora was after chemotherapy, but probably it will be of benefit here. I would like to see the EGFR mutant mutation status after chemotherapy um, you need at surgery. We did, you didn't mention that. But it's interesting to know. We repeat it after surgery. And it was, and again, yes, the same positive. mutation. Okay. I would... Maybe give this patient ozumertinib. Uh, um, Atizu adjuvant um, for EGFR mutant patients, I'm concerned about the data. Uh, if the patient is treated uh, 2018 or even today, no role of adjuvant after new adjuvant chemotherapy for the first question. For the second question, again, even if the patient is treated today, no role of ozumertinib after new adjuvant chemotherapy, because, because the ADORA trial, which led to approval of adjuvant ozimeritinib, one of the exclusion criteria was uh, previous new adjuvant chemotherapy. So upfront surgery followed by, by ozimeritinib, it's okay. Otherwise, no role of either ozimeritinib or uh, atizu for this patient, today or 2018. We need data, because we don't have the data file and after new adjuvant treatment. Yes. And according to the NCCN guideline, uh, the patient receive induction chemotherapy followed by surgery. And if the margin is negative, we can observe the patient. And regarding the ozomertinib and atezo, uh, yes, the ozomertinib approved for adjuvant therapy in patient with stage 1b, 3a, EGFR mutation, positive non-small cell lung cancer, but after complete tumor resection. 
based on Adora, uh, phase three trial. And yes, uh, the Adora uh, didn't include patient with, uh, on, after uh, receiving uh, induction or neoadjuvant chemotherapy, only cases after uh, complete resection with the uh, stage 1B uh, TEL 3A. Also the ATEZO, according to the EMPOWER 010, uh, the study design include the patient completely resected stage 1B to 3A non-small cell lung cancer according to the AGCC version 7 and not including uh, cases with uh, new adjuvant or receiving new adjuvant chemotherapy. So back to our uh, case, patient lost follow-up up, uh, up to uh, six months uh, and came to us in uh, October 2019 with CT chest showed left lung operative bed mass recurrence, three times three centimeter, with right lung multiple metastatic nodule, and the enlarged paratracheal prevascular and left hilar lymph nodes. And the bed CT uh, showed uh, left lung mass recurrence uh, at the operative bed with significant SUV, and uh, uh, again right pulmonary nodule with uh, significant SUV, and the enlarged left hilar lymph node with uh, SUV 18.9, still the patient in a good performance status uh, one. This is the PET CT. And now um, our question uh, to the panelists, uh, shall we go for re-challenge uh, the previous chemotherapy or start new line of chemotherapy or start uh, EGFR TKI uh, TKI is uh, either first or second generation, or uh, EGFR uh, TKI is third generation of the Martinet, or start IO monotherapy or IO in combination with chemotherapy. So if the patient can afford to go for a uh, third generation, I would definitely go for a third generation EGFR TKI inhibitor. If the patient cannot afford and can tolerate, yes. I would give him a first generation, but with a, in combination with chemotherapy. He's still, they're going to have responses and long overall survival. The longest overall survival is with this regimen, actually. Other opinion? Third generation, third generation. Single agent, uh, Osimertin. Osimertin, okay. So, uh, according to the NCC, NCCN guideline, Whenever uh, we treat uh, advanced case non-small cell lung cancer with actionable mutation like EGFR, EXO19, or deletion, or 21-point uh, mutation, uh, the prefer, uh, the, uh, whenever uh, or prior to the first-line uh, systemic therapy, whenever uh, available, uh, it's preferred to uh, offer the patient ozomertinib. Otherwise, uh, the first or second generation uh, TKIs are available, uh, uh, either erlotinib, afatinib, gefetinib, or dacometinib. Uh, and according to uh, the first uh, and second generation EGFR TKIs, which are approved by FDA and the EMA, based on uh, many uh, trials, uh, like, um, for example, gefetinib, either in uh, Asian uh, trials or global trials like IPASS or uh, uh, first signal, we showed a significant uh, PFS uh, benefit uh, in comparison to the comparator arm, which uh, is the standard of care platinum-based uh, chemotherapy, uh, with expected uh, PFS ranging from 8 uh, up to 14 months uh, versus uh, only 6 months in the arm of chemotherapy. And this is according to the overall response rate. We, uh, as we can see, almost doubled uh, overall response rate, uh, 71 versus 40, uh, 47 in the arm of uh, chemotherapy. And this is uh, the next generation uh, TKIs, uh, the ozomertinib based on the FLORA uh, double blind study design, uh, which include the uh, patient with exon 19, 21 mutation. Uh, in the first line, uh, and the randomization was ozomertinib versus the standard of care, uh, the first generation. Sorry. Gefetinib or erlotinib with a significant PFS, as we can see from the uh, two curves, Kaplan-Meier curves, and this is regarding the overall survival benefit. 
And so the decision, uh, the patient received uh, gefatinib, uh, the patient couldn't afford ozimertinib financially. Uh, the patient received a total uh, of 19 months of gefatinib with disease partial response clinically and metabolically by PET-CT. Patients start to complain of headache in uh, June 2021 with almost a disease-free interval 19 months. This is a brain MRI which showed uh, almost a three uh, focus of brain deposits and the bed CT showed left apical mass size uh, progression with newly developed left pulmonary nodule with significant SUV. Again, the patient still in a good performance status one. Uh, new core biopsy from the lung mass was taken which showed bronchogenic adenocarcinoma grade 2 to make sure that uh, there is, uh, we, we are searching for the causes of uh, uh, acquired or primary resistance. Uh, so we uh, take a new core biopsy which showed again bronchogenic adenocarcinoma grade 2. Uh, the uh, liquid biopsy to detect U790M mutation was negative and uh, on tissue uh, confirmed negativity. And the BDL1 at that time showed 70% by DACO technique 22C3. So uh, shall we consider the whole cranial irradiation or uh, consider stereotactic radiation therapy or shifting to ozimertinib or consider uh, gefatinib plus PEVA or shifting to chemo or chemo plus atezo plus PEVA? Any comment from panelists? I would add anti-angiogenic uh, to gefatinib with to anti-EGFR, uh, whether it is um, ramsimumab or even beva. Yani, I would go for number six. Yani, the problem is, uh, and this is what happens with the first generation when you give it alone. Yani, the median progression-free survival is truly it's 18 months, uh, uh, and the patient C790 negative. So the option is really chemotherapy, and because his uh, because he has a high PDL1 expression, I would go for the immunotherapy. But such an EGFR mutation, I would still go for the standard of care that we know is the quadruple regimen. If the patient can tolerate his 71? Uh, still, uh, uh, exon 21 point mutation positive, but T790M uh, still uh, negative in both plasma and the tissue. I would go for number six. Okay. Well, patient symptomatic or not symptomatic brain? Uh, regarding the brain meds, uh, not, symptom net, uh, not symptomatic. Okay. Only headache. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Regarding the brain meds. Any other comment? Uh, I will confirm the uh, treatment of the cranial disease, stereotactic yes. radiation, small, multiple, three, so I think, lesions. So you prefer lesions. to treat the cranial... I've heard to, yes, to the treat the radiation therapy, of course, the and I agree for the option number six. This patient has increased uh, BDL1 from 15% at presentation, and now 70%. She, she gained the, the, the maximum benefit from uh, anti-EGFR and no T790 mutation, so I will not go for ozimertinib. I prefer chemo plus uh, immune oncology. Yes. Um, I just want to highlight that you consider definitive local therapy SRS for limited lesions with uh, osmir tenib, okay? Or continue um, and co yes, yeah. according so yeah. having a bevacizumab with SRS is very dangerous. So you cannot mix both uh, SRS with, with bevacizumab okay. particularly. Okay. Yeah. Even after uh, the radiation, you sorry? you ca you can do it with the window of one month for me for window of one and a half month, but we cannot mix them together. Just to highlight this this point. Even with this SRS. Yes. For fear of what? I mean, this is bleeding uh, tendency. It it carry out a bleeding tendency, and there is a plenty of publications now when we use the SRS with those high fractionation dose with the bevacizumab in lung and in, um, um, I can't remember because um, I just have a, a lecture with the gynecological mm -hmm. SRS and I go through many, many uh, evidence that um, 
combination of the SRS and bepacizumab carry out a very, very dangerous uh, bleeding tendency and uh, complications for such a patient. Okay. Uh, and according to the NCCN uh, guideline, we uh, should search for the cause of acquired resistance and go directly for T790M testing uh, as a category one. Uh, and for prime metastasis, we consider definitive uh, local therapy with SRS for limited lesion and consider uh, ozomertinib if the uh, mutation positive or continue uh, the TKIs, uh, erlotinib or gefetinib with uh, anti-VGF, uh, either Ramu or Beva. And uh, this is uh, the study which include the EGFR TKI re-challenge, re-challenge with Beva in EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancer with a, a conclusion of uh, demonstrating a high disease control rate and modest uh, low, longer BFS uh, than the historical data on EGFR TKI's re-challenge alone. And this is... Sorry, Afish. Last time. So the decision to, uh, for the patient to receive the gamma knife therapy to the brain space occupying lesion and uh, to uh, continue with gefetinib in addition with bevacizumab. And the patient received a total nine cycle of beva plus gefetinib with a stable disease clinically by CT. Then the patient suffered from uh, left occipital parietal hemorrhagic infarction in April 2022 and uh, uh, Pevazizumab was omitted. Okay, uh, to, please, just I want to highlight this. Uh, can you just come back? You know? Okay. Yeah, that's why the patients had a hemorrhage. So, um, because we give the Pevazizumab with the high dose of the SRS but or... She, did, she didn't receive it she concurrently. Didn't? Uh, uh, after a while. Yeah, even after a while, time. we have to be very cautious in such a context. We have to separate a big window. And for me, give the radiotherapy and your story and give the patients whatever you want after one month. So this is the, the safe, uh, the safe uh, combination. If we are going to have a gamma, it's not gamma knife nowadays. Now after my my uh, lecture, you know that we can deliver SRS with Linux. It's just not a gamma knife, so any, any maneuver. So um, uh, I just want to highlight it very well. And here we have it in this patients. We, we develop a bleeding with SRS. So bevacizumab is very dangerous. Not only combination, but narrow window between two, two uh, combinations. Thank you. Okay. One comment, uh, I participated in uh, BIVA biosimilar clinical trials with Prof. Dr. Rabab a uh, few years ago. Uh, the, the, the main recommendation is to have a window four weeks at least between any radiation therapy and uh, BIVA. I think Dr. Sahar had mentioned that there was a gap between the yes. radiation therapy and <laughs> four weeks. Yes, yes. And I think Dr. Sahar had a four weeks window. And then the, the, the PET-CT showed the progressive disease with a new bone metastasis. The patient had no pony vein or bone-related complication. Still uh, good performance status, uh, echo performance status one. Uh, and according to the, uh, uh, some case study which showed a randomized phase two study of Jevetanib with or without uh, Pemetrexid as first-line treatment in non squamous non small cell lung cancer with EGFR mutation, which showed addition of Pemetrexid to EGFR TKI's gefetinib result in significant improvement of PFS and numerically longer OS compared with gefetinib in treatment naive patient. Again, this is not the first line, but we consider this uh, in our case scenario. So the decision uh, to receive palliative radiation therapy uh, on the weight bearing uh, osseous deposits plus monthly uh, the nuzumab uh, and uh, shifted the patient from, for pemetrexid plus gefetinib based on a case study. The patient received total four cycle of pemetrexid gefetinib with progressive disease clinically by CT uh, and another liquid biopsy for T790M mutation is still negative. Echo performance status now uh, two. I just sure. a question. Where is the data that you can give post-progression on gefitinib? You continue gefitinib with another combination. Where is the evidence for that? Uh, only 
case study. Case studies uh, like uh, issue. And yeah, probably uh, the patient study. didn't need to receive so, sigefitinib again. So what and, are... And we only tested for T790 mutation. We didn't test for any other mutations, Mishkina. Uh, we repeat it after, uh, after the new biopsy on the first progression. Mm -hmm. And again, yes, uh, no uh, other molecular profile rather than uh, the EGFR uh, mutation and the BDL1 70% by dacotechnique. And T790 M is still negative. We go, we go I through. I wouldn't give Gifetinib again. What, what other uh, options for this uh, case? Because, uh, yes, we have the Empower 150, uh, Atezo plus Chemo plus Beva, but uh, the Beva is omitted already from the protocol be because of the hemorrhagic infarction the patient developed. So we, we haven't other option. And the performance status, uh, the patient deteriorated and become two. So what other options for this case? Chemotherapy alone, uh, without even the BEVA or without the immunotherapy. Or you can give uh, PEMBRO, PEMBRO with uh, chemotherapy. And again, the results for EGFR mutation, it might be, um, but I wouldn't, if I'm going to give immunotherapy, I keep uh, the chemo. Uh, but I would, yani, for this patient, just chemotherapy single agent. Yani, the performance status too. She will not tolerate chemotherapy again. <laughs> Best supportive care. Okay, okay, we go we go evidence by strongest and uh, then we go down. Uh, yes, you had evidence for uh, anti-EGFR in first line and then incorporation of anti-angiogenic in second line. In third line, we, we go for case study if we do not have uh, much more evidence. And we have evidence for either uh, immunotherapy as single agent or uh, chemotherapy as single agent. Okay. Uh, any 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 recommendation will make the patient have the best quality of life in your own opinion. There is no guidelines in this stage for this patient. Yes, we are beyond the for, for this question, I don't think that there is evidence for immuno after immuno. I think we can shift to single agent uh, chemotherapy dose uh, taxel in a low dose. Uh, if not uh, tolerated or progressed, I will go for best supportive care. Okay. The patient so didn't receive immune. Pre <laughs> the patient is immune naive. As I said, first and second line, there was immune. No. The, the patient was immune naive up till now, right? Yes. yes huh? Didn't receive any kind of immunotherapy. Not immune after immune. It is the, the first time to receive immune. N not receiving yeah, yeah, yeah. immune before. Uh, only uh, plus uh, and then Jivatanib uh, plus chemo. Yes, no immunotherapy. So the, the patient go forward for uh, immunomonotherapy at ESO. Patient started uh, in August 2022. Uh, she received only two cycles and waiting assessment after four cycles. And we, uh, in our oncology committee, consider new tissue biopsy for uh, repeating the comprehensive genomic profile. Finally, I'd like to thank uh, our oncology committee in Egypt Air, uh, our uh, dear professor and mentor, Dr. Sharif Abdul Mahib, and of course, I'm very happy to be able to support us in the hospital. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, today I'm presenting a case of uh, metastatic uh, ALK positive uh, non-small cell lung cancer. Um, 
it's a, an actual case of a friend. Uh, he is a 33 year old uh, project manager, lives uh, and works in Qatar with uh, his wife and a daughter. Um, he is a smoker at 10 pack years, eco performance status zero at presentation, uh, has no history of uh, documented allergies or uh, comorbidities, uh, and um, not on any current uh, medications. Um, he has a family history of uh, lymphoma and a maternal uncle. Um, the condition started in June uh, 2022 with unsteady gait uh, while in Qatar. He uh, sought medical advice. Uh, his doctor organized an MRI, which revealed two brain lesions, uh, one uh, right cerebellar, uh, two centimeter, and uh, another one in the left hippocampus, uh, 1.1 centimeter, and both show post-contrast enhancement, diffusion restriction, and central necrosis, highly suspicious of being metastatic. Here we can see the cerebellar lesion, and there is also another one here in the left hippocampus. Um, patient was commenced on steroids and he asked to uh, come uh, to Egypt for uh, uh, opinion. Um, here we, he was staged with PET-CT, which showed left hilar lesion, 3.6 centimeter, uh, standard uptake value 7.4, attenuating the left bronchus and causing narrowing. Uh, uh, plus attenuation of left main pulmonary artery. Uh, there was uh, an avid aortopulmonary uh, uh, lymph node, uh, 2.8 centimeter. Uh, this is usually meant, uh, uh, me, um, uh, I think they mean uh, station five uh, mediastinal lymph node. Uh, uh, it was single lymph node, 2.8 centimeter. Uh, left upper loop avid satellite uh, uh, lesion, 1.2 centimeter. We can consider this an ipsilateral uh, lesion. Uh, and, um, and, and, and a nodule in an ipsilateral loop, 1.2 centimeter, uh, plus, uh, of course, the left temporal parietal brain lesion. MRI spectroscopy was done, and there's a collective data uh, uh, revealed, uh, met, uh, goes with metastatic deposit rather than a primary or, or a second primary lesion. Um, we will come to the staging. Here is the Heiler lesion. Bronchoscopy was done and revealed endobronchial exophytic mass obstructing left upper lobe uh, bronchus, biopsy uh, adenocarcinoma. Immunophenotyping was uh, CK7 positive, CK20 negative, TTF1 positive, napsin positive, P63 negative, and synaptophysine negative. Um, uh, marker testing was positive for ALK rearrangement, ALK fusion rearrangement, and PDL1 uh, was 60% uh, by uh, TPS score 2 to C3. And patient was negative four in TRK, KRAS, ROSE 1, and the EGFR mutations. So we have uh, the final staging clinical T3 uh, with a separate nodule in, an in the epsilateral loop, left upper loop, uh, N2 disease with station 5 solitary lymph node, and M1C. We have two tiny extra thoracic metastatic uh, deposits in a single uh, organ, which is a brain. Uh, BDL1 60% by TBS score and ALK positive rearrangement. Uh, the patient is 33 years, medically fit, uh, echo performance status zero. Uh, the main complaint is headache and unsteady gait. The performance is one, Dr. Krollos. Performance is one because uh, he, he is complaining of headache and unstable gait. Unstable gait due to the cerebellar lesion. Okay. The performance is one. Echo one. Uh, the main complaint is headache and unsteady gait. Now we have two questions. What uh, shall we do with the brain lesions and how we deal with the chest disease? The question is for uh, the dear balanced. Uh, actually, I, I would like to merge uh, both questions. Sorry? I, I'd, I'd like to merge sure. both questions because um, in the era of uh, new agents uh, anti-ALK, uh, there is a very good control of the CNS metastases uh, using uh, second generation uh, ALK inhibitors, uh, which may make us um, postpone radiation therapy later. If you would like to separate post question, we can treat the, the brain metastases with stereotactic uh, radiation and give uh, ALK inhibitor 
according to the NSCN, we have electinib, digitinib, and lorelotinib as the preferred options. Other options include seritinib. But I think if you have the ability to start with with electinib, you can postpone radiation therapy till through CNS progression because of the very good CNS control from these patients. Thank you. I agree. Second generation. So second generation ALK inhibitors are the standard of care now for a patient like this, and I wouldn't go for any local treatment for the brain for now. I agree 100 percent. But the question is, we have a symptomatic brain disease, uh, and uh, the arrangement of TKI therapy and the availability of the drugs maybe may take, may take um, maybe one or two months. Um, so shall we need uh, urgent local therapy for the brain disease? I do agree, uh, Krolos, with this uh, decision. In presence of uh, symptomatic brain meds, you have to irradiate the brain meds so either with whole cranial or maybe SVRT uh, to be followed by uh, consultation of the uh, pulmonologist, uh, Professor Yasser, uh, either to treat the chest uh, condition by endobronchial uh, laser fulguration or something like that. Do you agree with this? Third generation is uh, very beneficial, yes, in uh, metastatic non-small cell lung cancer to the brain. But for this patient, especially that you have serious uh, symptoms like gait disturbance and the place of uh, brain meds in the cerebellum uh, warrants uh, a very rapid and in local interference. And then we'd go for a lectin. Thank you. Uh, for question number one, what will you do? Due to the brain lesions, in case we agreed upon uh, local treatment to the brain metastasis, uh, how will we treat uh, the brain uh, two lesions, one, two centimeter and 1.2? Uh, we have uh, whole cranial surgery, stereotactic body uh, brain radiotherapy uh, plus uh, uh, surgery or stereotactic alone or no treatment. In my opinion, surgery is not feasible in such a case, uh, so I'll go with uh, SBRT. The patient has uh, three lesions. I don't think he's going two to legions. Have, uh, he, two yes, lesions only. Two more than one lesion. Yes. And he is symptomatic. It's better to control by radiation therapy. Uh, I would prefer localized radiation therapy, not whole brain, uh, not, not whole cranial radiation, to preserve the, the cognitive function of the patient. Um, bronchogenic adenocarcinoma are the most common tumors to metastasize to the CNS. Of the patient with non small cell lung cancer, we have uh, 30 to uh, 64. Kiru, Kiru. Okay. That, comment. The question? Hello? Yes. Um, would you please just uh, display the, uh, the imaging for the two legions because this is very important? Um, yes. We have um, one cerebellar and one hippocampal, I think so. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, those are uh, the, the cerebellar region is okay for me. I can go for uh, fractionated uh, SRS. It's not single dose. It will be fractionated because the mass is exceeding the two centimeters. But the hippocampal mass is very crucial. So this mass could cause to you that the patients have a complication that you cannot give him anything, even neither surgery or chemo or anything. So. Um, the hippocampal mass, you have to be very, very cautious, and we will give it the maximum fractionation that we can do. We cannot give it a single lesion. This is um, just um, uh, uh, details of radiotherapy, but I know because we had a patients have a, a hemorrhage now, and we don't know and we don't ask how many fractionation when we deliver the patients from the gamma knife, just send it and have a radiotherapy and everything will be okay. So for my colleagues in the medical oncology side and surgical side, I want you just to um, have a look and discuss with the radiation oncologist what's next and what's before each case because it do affect. So both will be uh, fractionated, long fractionation, maybe eight. I will give them eight fractions, not three, not five. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. No, not three or five, uh, because yeah. of the... Uh, Similarity to the hippocampus. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's very, okay. very, very, uh, very harmful. 
and and you cannot gamble with with such a hippocampal mess you will face a hatta di law ditu baad kada ay haga فيها تندنسي الهيموريج هينزف واحنا كان عندنا حاله قبل ما انت تيجي احمد نزفت فيها. Would you would you plan it and look at the dose to the hippocampus before you choose your fractionation or would you say I would go for for example classic three it. to five yeah. and then if the hippocampus is not spared then you would well in this in such a context I'm 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 not I'm not uh, Mm -hmm. Having any hope to save the hippocampus, I would. Because if you give if you give eight in this case, it would be rather uh, conventional radiotherapy rather than. I can go therapy. for normal hypo. Mm -hmm. I can go for normal hypo, and this is what I stated in my previous lecture. Mm -hmm. If you are feeling that it is not safe to deliver SPRT, it's not a fashion. It's a way to treat the patient, so you can always go for hypo. Or go for the conventional fractionation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank Carry you. on. Okay. Um, of the patient with non-small cell lung cancer, we have 30-64% uh, to 64, uh, percent de who develop CNS metastases in the course of disease, of which 4 to 7% percent present with leptomeningeal disease. Brain metastases should be treated with steroids and local therapy when symptomatic. Treatment of patients with brain metastases with or without leptomeningeal involvement and no driver mutations is dependent on prognosis. Prognosis can be estimated based on uh, RTUG recursive uh, partitioning analysis, uh, which classifies patient into three uh, classes. Uh, one, uh, patients are uh, those uh, below 65 years old with good performance status, Kornofsky uh, more than 70. Uh, and the class uh, three uh, uh, represents patients with Kornofsky score uh, below 70, and class two, uh, any patient in between. Um, um, RBA class three patients, we have evidence from Quartz trial that radiotherapy uh, is not recommended, and the supportive care is as equal as uh, whole brain radiotherapy for those uh, special class of patients. Um, according to ISMO guidelines, in case of limited uh, number of metastatic uh, disease in the brain and RBA class one or two, we can uh, proceed for SRS alone. Uh, randomized trials uh, evaluating SRS have included patient with uh, one uh, up to four brain metastases. Uh, SRS has increasingly become the favored modality due to reduced morbidity compared with whole brain surgery. Of course, the cognitive impairment uh, the patient suffer with uh, whole cranial irradiation. Um, the Japanese trial um, in the, the box here uh, included patients up to uh, 10 uh, metastatic foci in the brain. And it established a new concept in treatment of uh, brain metastasis with uh, stereotactic uh, radiotherapy uh, that the tumor volume and the absolute size, rather than the number of metastases, are the treatment criteria for selection for uh, stereotactic radiotherapy. Uh, going uh, rapidly through the NCCN guidelines regarding the case, uh, uh, if we have a stage 4A M1B or limited M1C disease and patient is, is ECOG 0 to 2 uh, with limited metastases, uh, here uh, in the class of brain metastases, we can go for stereotactic radiosurgery alone or surgical resection if patient is symptomatic or uh, warranted for diagnosis. Um, um, okay, we, ha we, we already biopsied the patient, so we don't need to uh, operate the brain to get tissue, but we could uh, have considered operating the brain if the patient has uh, uh, severe obstructive hydrocephalus uh, or maybe severe mass effect from the brain lesions that could uh, uh, need uh, urgent surgery. Uh, but anyway, we will start, according to NCN, we will start with the brain uh, uh, treatment. Options include surgical resection. Okay, Kirill, just for the sake of time, can you just move on yes. to what you've okay. done? Okay. I would like to highlight for multiple metastases, whole brain surgery is still recommended, especially for patients with uh, equal performance below two. This is uh, um, uh, this is second question. How would we treat the chest disease? Um, options include uh, this is an M1 disease treatment is palliative. Or um, uh, we can go radically with uh, upfront concurrent chemotherapy or maybe surgery. 
uh, or we can uh, form a, uh, a mixture of modalities with starting with systemic survey and uh, considering local uh, local survey uh, after why. Uh, the question for the panelists: What would you prefer? Who who would go for 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 who would go for a radical? Let's first start easy. This is an alt positive metastatic disease. Mm. Mm. So Only sites of metastasis are a couple of brain lesions. Who would go for a radical treatment option at this point? Okay, this is by definition metastatic brain lesion. So this is M1. However, it's oligometastatic. Patient is very young. Patient is very fit. So no one would consider at this point radical treatment. Okay. We don't have a surgeon. No one would like to operate. The question yeah. here, what kind of treatment do you want to give this patient who already has metastatic disease? He has N2 disease. What kind of treatment would you like to give for that patient? This is the question we are posing to the panel. Yeah. So systemic treatment. Wh what would all? you give? I would give a second generation TKI inhibitor. Like? You have three important ones. Okay. You have the lorlatinib, you have the uh, lectinib, you have the bigatinib. So okay. you do have choices. Wh which yeah, one would you give? I wouldn't. Which one? Mm. So alectinib. Alectinib, all right. Or brigatinib or lorlatinib. They are all. They all have excellent CNS. Uh, okay. Right. So what would you give? I mean, I don't understand the questions. Uh, uh, We're who, asking who here. Who give concurrent chemo radiotherapy for an mm. alt positive metastatic patient? Okay, fair enough. I'm, I'm just asking. Would you do that? No. Okay. Upfront surgery uh, for N2 disease doesn't make sense. A mixture of starting systemic treatment and then consider radical radiotherapy. But would you be able, even after you give a local treatment, would you consider stopping the ALK inhibitor? I would doubt that very much. So okay. I think the standard of care, the standard of care for an ALK positive metastatic disease is to give, and if you, your patient has brain mass specially, then they need to give second generation TPI okay. inhibitor. This is your yeah, opinion? That's my opinion. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, do, you have, do you have any evidence that there is a better survival for the patient by using radical treatment of choices B and C? By, use, by using? B or C or D. Okay. I, no, I, this, this is just a list of options. Survival for this does not patient. necessarily mean that these are all right or these are all the best treatment. These are all options just to explore there different no evidence schools of, of thought. Improving here. survival by doing surgery for M1 disease mm. the patient. You wouldn't do surgery? No. Okay. So we all agree we wouldn't do surgery in such a scenario? No surgery. All right. And if you're starting with systemic treatment up front, like Dr. Ola said, would you give chemotherapy or we give ALK inhibitors? ALK inhibitors, right. And preferably second or third generation. Okay. Dr. Sharif, do you concur with this? No. Yes. The same, uh, maybe. Okay. Uh, All right. Thank you. You, you okay, asked me what I would do. I would do the same, but actually, I would prefer alectinib over lorlatinib because we do have some data on activity of lorlatinib post alectinib, but we don't data. We don't have data on the opposite. So I would rather start with Alectinib first and then leave, leave it until later. So what did you do uh, actually? Eventually? You know what? That was true before you had the other option. So Brigatinib is still there and you can always use Brigatinib after them. So but the, the one with the most penetration to the brain was Lorlatinib. Although yeah. we know from the Jalex and the Alex studies mm -hmm. that Alectinib uh, works very well. However, I don't have evidence on Alectinib post lorlatinib that's why most i wouldn't give alectinib post lorlatinib but you still have brigatinib. exactly yeah that's why yeah. i favor giving alectinib first and spare the lorlatinib until yeah. later particularly that is a more broad spectrum alk inhibitor your opinion okay. so what did you do uh Kirullis, actually okay according to uh ismo uh, guidelines the term oligometastasis refers to a limited number of distant metastases uh it's around five metastases or below Okay. And this class of patients with limited synchronous metastasis at diagnosis, uh, they may experience long-term disease-free survival following systemic therapy and local consultative therapy. Local consultative therapy could be high-dose radiotherapy or surgery. According to NCCN guidelines, patients with 
limited oligometastatic disease, uh, brain metastasis, and otherwise limited disease in the chest may benefit from aggressive local therapy to both the primary and the metastatic sites. Well, they did not mention the timing. This is what we're saying. Yes, yes. That you want to gain good control, systemic control first. System yes, uh, okay, this is illustrated in this slide. Okay. Okay, if definitive therapy for thoracic disease is feasible, according to NCCN, consider systemic therapy yes. and restaging yes. to confirm non-progression or proceed to definitive chemotherapy. Okay. Okay, and this, in, in, in our case, we have a T3 and a 2 disease, we can go for definitive chemoradiation. Comment. Okay. This is, you have... Yeah, and you skipped an alk positive disease. Yeah, into that, definitely normal if you don't have oncogenic driven mutation. Yes. So this shouldn't be here in terms of food to the NCN guidelines that alk positive disease. I will go to uh, this uh, uh, in the next few slides. Okay, do Dr. Ahmed, into, do you want to comment on? Sure. Uh, yes, I appreciate the data for oligometastatic disease. However, the majority of, uh, of trials for oligometastatic are either derived from uh, East trials and Japanese trials, which yes. is a very aggressive trials in every disease. Like for example, uh, as you go for surgery in metastatic gastric cancer and so on. This is for a second and the majority are before the era of uh, targeted therapies uh, and more or less not applicable on uh, oncogen uh, driven disease. Because if we started electinib, which is a standard, and then we would go for local treatment, treatment this patient is T3, N2, and then the M is cerebellar. If you start with electinib, you have a very high possibility that you have a negative PET CT. What would we go for? Uh, what is the benefit of local treatment? And if we, you would like to go for definitive chemo radiotherapy, what is the rationale of uh, receiving another line after systemic electinib to give chemotherapy with radiotherapy? And there is no data on the safety of electinib uh, plus definitive dose of radiotherapy. So you, you would go, go for stoppage of electinib. Do you have the luxury uh, to stop electinib for six to seven weeks for uh, controlling a local disease which is not symptomatic? I, I do not think that this is a good option uh, based on these uh, retrospective data. Okay. So. Um, uh, the, the, the local therapy, of course, here is uh, consolidated. We can give it if, even if um, uh, PET CT is negative after alectiny. It's consolidated, anyways. We are not treating the disease. Uh, and we so have. You, you said consolidative after a period of systemic control. Yes. 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 After process. What would be considered an optimal period for systemic control, Dr. Ahmed? If he is going to go for uh, definitive or uh, the option, the concept of uh, oligometastatic disease, he will go for definitive radiotherapy. Even if he didn't give concomitant chemo radiotherapy, he, he will go for six to seven weeks as per definition of definitive radiotherapy. So uh, can you stop electinib for six to seven weeks or would you go for continuation uh, electinib during a definitive period? Okay, so, so you're concerned about stopping the treatment. And Dr. Ola. What is the optimal time after which you might consider a consolidative or a radical treatment? Hmm? Or you wouldn't con consider, wouldn't a radical consider, treatment. consider a radical treatment? Radical treatment. You treat him palliative all the way. I will not stop electinib. All right. Or lorlatinib or brigatinib, whichever we choose. Yet, uh, you need to put into consideration that this patient went into remission because of the ALK inhibitor. Stopping the ALK inhibitor will okay. is, is an issue. All right. You will have remetasis again. Okay. So, so you would carry on with the systemic treatment all the way down. All the all way. To Russia. Unless I can go for surgery, but. Okay. Mm -hmm. But but the surgery also will interrupt the treatment for some time. And then I continue on uh, again. Okay. Doctor Mohammed. Al Same. ALK until uh, ALK inhibitor until progression or until level toxicity. Okay, Doctor Shreve. Uh, the same uh, decision, but if uh, you are considering chemo radiation, so after uh, maximum two to three months, not beyond. Two to three months of systemic treatment, you would consider radical option. Yes. So can I ask, what's the concern of combining radical radiotherapy with electinib or ALK inhibitors? What's the caveat of doing that? I mean, we do, we do that with chemotherapy, with more aggressive treatments. Yes. So 
What's the caveat of that? I was not thinking, what Dr. Ahmed started the debate, I was not thinking actually of interrupting the more important treatment, which I agree with you, the elective. So as a clinical oncologist, I would actually give both together. I would carry on with, with both together. But anyway, I'm still curious what you've done in this case. So I think we have a consensus here that systemic treatment in this patient is by far more important than local control. And you can defer the radiotherapy treatment unless to the brain, unless the patient is really symptomatic. And this young chap was really symptomatic, so we had to give uh, stereotactic radiotherapy to, to be administered up front. And you, correct me if I'm wrong, Kiros, you've given alectinib or seretinib or some second generation, all right. Seretinib, my fast. Okay, crizotinib. Okay, so we're talking about second and third generations. All oh, right, okay. Okay, I will skip this. Um, I will go rapidly uh, into uh, the results of Alex trial. Um, when patients were uh, challenged with alectinib versus crizotinib in the first line, uh, ALK positive non-small cell lung cancer. And here is uh, the results for uh, progression-free survival Kaplan-Meier curve and the forest plot uh, comparing ill hazard ratios uh, along uh, the different subgroups. And it was positive for favoring alec uh, alectinib over crizotinib. The median progression-free survival for alectinib was uh, 34.8 months, and for crizotinib it was 10.9 months uh, in the updated results, fi updated final results. And also uh, for the overall survival, it favored alectinib at five years with 62% uh, uh, of patients alive at five years, while crizotinib was 45% alive at five years. And uh, here is an insight about CNS progression, which uh, was higher in the crizotinib group compared to uh, alectinib group. So. Uh, the decision to start with alectinib uh, comes first. Uh, of, of course, this is according to guidelines uh, from NCCN. Uh, for ALK rearrangement positive patient, the whole uh, the whole uh, uh, subtypes of uh, metastatic disease. But for brain uh, disease, uh, alectinib comes first. Uh, of course, brigatinib, lorlatinib, seritinib, and crizotinib can be considered as first line. But in our in our case. Alectinib would be preferred, uh, especially uh, like Dr. Ahmed Hassan said, lorlatinib can be given in the second line after alectinib. What actually happened uh, so far, patient was treated with stereotactic radiosurgery. Dr. Rasha, I think, uh, won't agree with uh, Dr. Soha, I, I'm sorry, won't agree with uh, this uh, uh, fractionation. But uh, this is what happened anyways, 24 gray stereotactic uh, surgery was delivered to the two brain lesions. Um, uh, okay, the patient has a uh, maximum disease diameter two centimeter. So it's arguably we can consider uh, stereotactic radiosurgery. Uh, Qatar team recommended induction chemo followed by radical surgery. This was an opinion given to the patient and he asked for another opinion in Egypt. Uh, MDT review um, advised for systemic therapy, preferably with electinib or lorlatinib. Uh, initially, then consider local treatment after achievement of proper systemic control. Patient opted for one cycle of emtrexid cisplatin till alectinib was provided by his insurance, and he is currently in the second month of TKI therapy with no notable toxicity, and he is planned for restaging by PET-CT, uh, maybe after six months of therapy after achieving proper systemic control, IMRT to the chest disease to a total dose of 66 to 66 gray over seven weeks can be added uh, to uh, systemic uh, therapy, then TKI will be maintained afterwards in disease progression or acceptable test. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Dr. Uh, before I just close this case, I want to ask our uh, respiratory team, Dr. Yasser, uh, Dr. Marwa, Dr. Hussam, in a 33 years old gentleman who's an engineer, site engineer, yeah? He's a site engineer. What kind of exposure would you expect this it could be actually not related actually to uh, occupational hazard, but if, but if it's occupational hazard, what kind of exposure do, would you expect uh, in this gentleman's case? Shukran, Dr. Ahmed, shukran to Farid Ain Shams al Hayya. It's a chance to thank you and thank you to my friends and my friends, Dr. Iman, the chairman of the committee. 
وانا عشت سنين دكتوراه معاك وفي البراك ثيرابي كنت بعمله في الاندو برونكيال كارسينوما فعلاقتي باسم الانكولوجي الحقيقه يعني وطيده. آه هو طبعا ممكن اول اكسبوجر احنا ما خدناش ديتيلز عن الانجويتش ويتش تايب اوف انجينيرنج هي هاد فممكن قوي يتعرضوا ليورانيوم او سامثينج لايك ذات هو تشيز يعني الحقيقه منتشر جدا في الروكس وفي ال وفي الحاجات اللي بيتعاملوا بيها المهندسين هو كونستراكشن انجينير في الدوحه كونستراكشن انجينير في الدوحه اه كونستراكشن انجينير بس ما اقدرش اقول اكتر من كده ما اعرفش اكتر من كده الحقيقه صعب صعب ان احنا تو تريس سامثينج لايك ذات لكن ميبي هازلز يعني هو فعلا فيري يونج ايج وبعدين انا مش برضو مش عارف احنا خدنا منه فاميلي هيستوري ولا لا هل في العيله في كيسز اوف برونكوجينيك اور اذر تايبز اوف مالجنس احنا بدانا نشوف دلوقتي او مش بنشوف دلوقتي ده من زمان مالجنس ران ان فاميليز يعني ايفن حتى مش نفس نوع المالجنس يعني لكن سوري دكتور هي هاز هيستوري اوف ليمفوما ان ماترنال انك هي هاز هيستوري اوف ليمفوما ان ماترنال انك ليمفوما ليمفوما طيب في بوست جينيتيك ذا بيزنس بوزيشن شكرا شكرا طيب we'll move on to the next uh, case just for the sake of time عشان also limited by the prayer ان شاء الله ونكست از انذر عين شمس جراديويت ماي دير كوليج اند فريند دكتوره نجاح اند شي از جوينج تو بريزنت ا فيري انترستنج كيس اكشولي ذير ار ماني كي كويستشنز ان ذيس كيس وين اي لوكد ات ذا سلايد اون ماي واي بس فور ذا سيك اوف تايم اجين دكتوره نجاح ويل ستيك تو تايم ذيس تايم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فرص في اول اي وود لايك تو ثينك عين شمس كلينيكال اونكولوجي ديبارتمنت فور جيفينج مي ذيس اوبورتونيتي عين شمس كلينيكال اونكولوجي ديبارتمنت از ماي فرست اند بي لافد هوم ذا بيشنت از A male patient, 44 years old, having no relevant comorbidities. He is a non-smoker, echo performance zero, having a past history of papillary thyroid carcinoma, and uh, underwent total thyroidectomy followed by radioactive iodine ablation, then was kept on thyroxine suppression. In 2019, the patient developed pulmonary embolism, complicating a traumatic femur fracture and received oral anticoagulation for six months. The patient was presented in December 2019, complaining of dysnea. The diagnostic whole body scan for the patient showed no abnormality, and the thyroglobulin was uh, normal. CT chest showed a right lung mass, proved by PET-CT to be an avid lesion, SUV 29.3. Measuring 5.3 by 3.9 meter uh, centimeters, T3 lesion with precaval pretracheal lymph node, epsilateral right hilar and subcarinal lymph nodes. The largest was 2.4 by 2.3 centimeter, SUV 22.5. MRI was done for the patient at that time and it was unremarkable. These are the images at presentation showing the long lesion and the nodal involvement. A biopsy showed to be poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma of lung origin. It was CEA positive, NAPSIN positive, TTF positive, CK56 and CDX2 negative. Molecular profile done for the patient at that time was the EGFR and was wild. ALK negative, PDL was 60% by RACO staining. This was the available at that time. So by staging, the patient is T3. And to stage 3B non small cell lung cancer. What are the available options for this gentleman to go for surgery followed by adjuvant radiation therapy, or by adjuvant treatment, or definitive concurrent chemo radiation, or induction chemotherapy, then concurrent, then consider surgery, or chemotherapy, then radiotherapy, chemo alone, radiotherapy alone, or other options? Others. Where, or wouldn't you like to give uh, new adjuvant immunotherapy, Muslim? Okay. Give concurrent chemo radiation for T3 and 2. Our surgeons definitely say no 
to surgery in such a presentation with bilateral lymph nodes and with this distribution. The challenging part might be including the whole volume of the disease in a radiotherapy from the start. But if it's doable, then you can consider it. Dr. Muhammad, what would you do? What would you do? With similar scenarios. I will give concurrent chemo radiation. Concurrent chemo radiation. This is a locally advanced okay. T3N2. Uh, if incompatible in radiotherapy field, you would go for concurrent. Yes, I will go. Okay. And I think it is it is okay. uh, feasible. So, would you like to come? Okay, by NCC and guidelines, this patient is a candidate for definitive concurrent chemo radiation. The MDT decision at the time stated that the patient is not a candidate for surgery. Then the patient was planned for induction chemotherapy, received Bamtrax cisplatin, followed by concurrent chemo radiation with etoposide cisplatin. Baseline okay. assessment. Can, can we take Dr. Ahmed's opinion regarding the choice? Yeah, what is the value of switching concomitant chemo radiotherapy? Yes, we would go for definitive concurrent chemo radiotherapy. Just to, to, to reduce the size of the lesion. No, 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 I, I do not uh, talk about this. You, ch you uh, selected permetrexid platinum. You, st you selected permeter alemta platinum. Why didn't uh, you continue on platinum uh, permetrexid with the radiotherapy? Why you shift to another line of chemotherapy? At that time, Dr. Ahmed, uh, there was uh, a study that uh, preferred to give uh, Vipsid uh, cisplatin um, in spite that Alimta cisplatin is working uh, with radiation. But at that time, um, uh, I have in the literature that uh, Vipsid cisplatin will be more beneficial with chemotherapy, uh, with radiotherapy than Alimta cis. Yeah, yeah. And, and just for our young uh, colleagues, all options like PEM, but, platinum, but you can, yes, yes. carb, oh, continue. Yeah. Yes. to be started from day one radiotherapy and to continue. Yes, yeah. you are right, sir. Okay. And we have a comment from Dr. Ahmed, our radiology consultant. Uh, sorry, uh, I will not talk about uh, any regimen. I'm a radiologist. Just uh, back to the PET CT images. Uh, Regarding a 44 years old male, uh, I think we must consider the uptake in the lower lumbar and iliac crest bilaterally, uh, which is, I don't think it will be degenerative for such age uh, 44. Uh, we must consider uh, for further assessment by bone scan or even MRI to exclude any marrow infiltration, because of course, this may uh, alternative uh, your opinions about the treatments. Anna, Dr. Ahmed, uh, in 2022, what's your preferred systemic treatment in the form of new adjuvant? New adjuvant? Yeah. Well, actually, you can consider cisplatin or carboplatin, but preferably cisplatin with Pemetrex. But the Americans like, for example, etoposite, I was just talking to, when we've been involved together with David Carbone in one of the sessions, they said, this is his standard of care, whether induction or concurrent. So they are all alternative options. Combining the partner with a platinum could be a taxane, could be platinum, it could be a topozide or pemetrex. What we don't like is gemcitabine because of the adverse yeah, interaction with. But you therapy. wouldn't like to add immunotherapy at all. Ah, and the neoadjuvant, neoadjuvant before. 2022. Radiotherapy or surgery. Uh, before surgery, I might consider immunotherapy. As the, why I'm asking this question mm. because the responses, the pathological responses that we see mm. with adding immunotherapy, is amazing. But in 2022, we cannot write just chemotherapy. We mm. have to have that option to be there. Thanks for bringing this up. I agree, but I think we still have to wait for the data before radiotherapy because I agree with you. Before uh, before surgery. The benefit of pathological complete response, which we've all seen in the literature, might warrant if we have access to this. But I believe this patient was treated even before uh, the data comes out. So this patient was treated. When was this patient treated? 2019. So I think we did not have this data at the time. His, his PDL 160%, so he might benefit from it. Baseline assessment for the patient done with odometric creatinine clearance, and the patient was referred to a vascular surgeon in our facility, fixed a port case and was kept on 
prophylactic anticoagulation owing to his history of pulmonary embolism. <clears throat> Based on Corona predictive model for chemo, therapy associated VTA, the patient was found to have an intermediate risk to develop VTE, so he was kept on oral anticoagulation for six months, apexapan. The patient started three cycles of Pemtrex cisplatin. Evaluation by CT showed a partial response in the lung mass. It is now 3.7 by 2.4 centimeter compared to 5.3 by 4 centimeter, and there was a partial response also in lymph nodes. The largest now is 1.4 by 0.9 centimeter. And according to the blend, the patient was referred to concurrent chemo radiation with etoposide cisplatin. Completed 66 gray on 24th June 2020. The CT evaluation showed further regression in the lung mass. It is now 3 by point. 1.5 centimeter and the lymph node is 1 by 0.7 centimeter. These are the images after induction chemotherapy and after concurrent chemo radiation. What is the next step for this patient? When was the scan done post treatment? How far is the scan from the end of treatment? Before treatment? No, the scan, the first follow up scan, the assessment scan. When was it done in, in relation to the treatment? After, after treatment by two weeks. Two weeks, okay. So is this the optimal timing to assess response to radio, chemo radio? When would you do a scan, uh, Ahmed? Six weeks after completion, at least. But so obviously, she's going to give derva about the kedafa. That's why she did the scan. <laughs> <by> <laughs> <Yes. Right. laughs> Okay, tell us about what you've done. The patient received three cycles. Um, okay. Uh, what is the next step? Sorry, on a better account. No, no, patient there is fit. Patient there. Uh, yes, can... performance okay. status zero. All right. Uh, by NCCN guidelines, he is a candidate to start the Velomap. This was based on the Pacific trial, included all patients with unresectable stage 3 non-small cell lung cancer without progression after definitive platinum-based concurrent chemo radiation with performance status good 0 to 1, and including all cameras regardless of the BDL status. The patients were, were randomized to DORVA uh, versus placebo within 42 days post-concurrent chemo radiation. So let, let, let me just ask you, if this patient was PDL1 negative, would you have considered the Valumab maintenance? If this patient was PDL1 negative to start with, yes. would you have considered? Yes. All right. Yes. In okay. the US, yes. In Europe, no. Okay. Yes. And Dr. Ahmed? Yes, uh, same for the indication of Derva, but I have a comment on this patient because the Pacific trial uh, didn't include patients receiving induction chemotherapy for three yes. cycles and then definitive concomitant chemo radiotherapy. If we stick to the guideline, the patient will not be eligible for DERVA. And, and this is one of the drawbacks of starting neoadjuvant chemotherapy and then going for definitive chemo radiotherapy because okay. the, the patient will, will not be a good candidate as per gu guidelines for maintenance uh, for consolidation DERVA. But we do have a lot of real uh, life data. Real world data. Yeah, yeah, yes. uh, by yeah. the end of the day, if you do have a residual disease, then Really, the standard of care mm -hmm. is to give immunotherapy. Dr. Mohammed Abrahman. I, I, I agree with Dr. Uh, Ahmed. Uh, if you would like to stick to the trial design, this is okay. But if you would like to go to the rational beyond the trial, mm -hmm. we have two rational. First, the described by Dr. Aula is there must be a residual disease. And second is the immunogenic effect caused by radiation therapy. So I agree to extrapolate and give it to And you would not do, a, you would not rely on PDL1 results. Um, to decide whether to give irrespective, it. Irrespective of the, the patient one. Was, okay. The patient was initially uh, BDL 60% by the Custaini. 60%? 60%. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Well, by the way, just Tiani, uh, to comment on that, definitely free real world data, which is not the best quality data, but it's a real world data that some give because many of our patients, actually, we conducted a study in, in Shams and we find that the big majority of our patients, more than two thirds of our patients, go for sequential rather than. Um, so, in other tumor settings, 
in other country settings, they looked at the real world data and they found that many oncologists, if they do have access, they can prescribe Durvalumab post-sequential, they give Durvalumab post-sequential. And there is an ongoing clinical trial uh, sponsored by AstraZeneca uh, for this at the moment. So what have you done? Um, uh, based on the data of the updated survival analysis, the patient uh, uh, will benefit from uh, Durvalumab uh, in the OS with a hazard ratio 0.7 and the PFS hazard ratio 0.55. So the patient started Durvalumab, finished three months of treatment in uh, at the end of 2020 with got tolerability apart from self-limiting grade one pneumonitis that occurred two months after treatment. In dream CT assessment after three months of treatment showed almost total resolution of the lung mass and mediastinal lymph nodes with pleural subsegmental consolidation likely radiation pneumonitis. These are the images following three months of Durvalumab. Then the patient continued another three months of Durvalumab till March 21, but started to complain of exertional dyspnea. Uh, at that time, there was a COVID pandemic uh, era, and it was actually difficult to reach what is the cause of dyspnea at that patient. What are the possible causes? Is it disease progression, pulmonary embolism, immune-related pneumonitis, radiation pneumonitis, COVID, or others? Um, my question to dear pulmonologists in uh, in the panel, uh, how to reach a diagnosis of the increasing desnia in this patient? في كذا option حقيقة في احتمال البالمونر إمبوليزم برضو وارد لأن العيان بريد إسبوزد من كذا ناحية و immune related pneumonitis or radiation pneumonitis برضو وارد disease progression وارد الكوفيد بعيد شوية لأن ما فيش clinical manifestations الحقيقة يعني تقول إن العيان جاله كوفيد بس هي الإيرة بقى بتحكم يعني فطبعا we need further studies يعني I recommend الحقيقة في عيان زي ده إن أنا أعمل multi slice CT pulmonary angio to exclude حاجة زي ال زي ال pulmonary embolism وفي نفس الوقت برضه اطلب من الدكتور احمد عثمان ان هو يعلق لي على اللانج بارينكيما فور اني بوسيبيليتي فور نيومونايتس او اي فيروس. كان وي جو باك تو السلايد يا نجم دكتور احمد بس جه بعد يعني هو الكومبلين كان بعد ال بعد السي تي شاست مش 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 اثناء ده. يس افتر كان بيفور ذا بيشنت كومبلين اوف ذيس نيو. يس ذيس از بيفور ستارتنج ذيس. يعني جزاست يعني راديشن انديوز نيمونايتس فايبروزز ات اوبرت ات ذا سيم سايت اوف ذا ماس اند جاست راديشن نيمونايتس ات ذيس ليفل يا هو احنا هي البوينت اللي عايزه تو برينج اب نجاح ان احنا عندنا البيشنت ده وان وي شود بوت اول كونسيدريشنز ان احنا بندي ايمينو ثيرابي هدي ثلاث شهور مش كده ثلاث شهور ايمينو ثيرابي وال بيشنت خد ريديو ثيرابي والبيشنت ده عنده هيستوري اوف سيجنيفيكانت Uh, thromboembolic event. Fahia, she's putting all, all options on the table to consider when she's looking at the scan. But if you want to rule out Haga or Haga, what thought be taken by Mrs. Zay? CT Balmora Andrew will exclude yes, at least will, the, uh, the two uh, options. Uh, okay. Please, we will exclude Balmora and Blism and any yes. Balink Mel. This is the most uh, threatening. Orders uh, COVID yeah, by CT Balmora Andrew, we can exclude. Pulmonary embolism, we can exclude COVID, we can exclude uh, parenchymal affection for any reason. We can even uh, diagnose disease progression uh, um, uh, by the same modality. Okay. CT pulmonary angiography done for the patient. Dr. Rasha, they comment. Can you give the slide of the options, please? Uh, some of my friends, uh, chest, chest doctors, uh, told me in such a case that we can do a therapeutic test by steroids because the immune-related pneumonitis and radiation pneumonitis and COVID-19 will be better, will get better gradually by steroids. And at the same time, the patient can take clomerical weight to for pulmonary embolism. 
If he did not improve, then he, uh, we should suspect disease progression. This, if, this is just in case of emergency. Well, the best, best management of such scenarios is bringing the patient to the MDT discussion with the radiologists and pulmonologists and involving them for the discussion of the management plan. But as I said, the immunotherapies, the guidelines, upon initial suspicion it could be immune-related, you have to start steroids right away, give antibiotics. There's no harm from giving antibiotic right away until you settle what's the definitive diagnosis for the patient's symptoms. CT pulmonary angiography was done for the patient and showed no abnormalities. In dream CT assessment showed stable disease. PCR was done as the patient was feverish and it was negative. The patient received antibiotics and oral prednisolone one milligram per kg per day with improvement within a few days of treatment. And at the time it was considered grade two pneumonitis related to IO. And steroids were tapered and the patient resumed treatment for further three months of treatment. Now he finished nine months of Dervaloma. Can I, can I just ask, you know, this is a very important educational point. For how long have you given the steroids? For how long have you given the steroids? Steroids for two weeks. And then he stopped? Then resume treatment. When the dose is lower than 10 milligram, I will tell uh, in the next. Step. It is very imperative to carry on with the steroids for at least four to six weeks. Well, even if the patient has regressed to grade zero or grade one, which are considered acceptable to carry on with your treatment, but it is very important because all the studies. He, he received stopped. the steroids for four weeks, then tapers over two weeks. Okay, so he received steroids six weeks. Six all weeks. All right, this is what I mean. So it's very important to clarify the premature interruption of steroids led to flare of symptoms upon re-challenging with immunotherapy. Just to highlight this. To Rahmat, guys. Yes, I agree with you. The, the most important issue clinical-wise is to exclude uh, uh, fungal pneumonitis. Because you can, we can start steroids and uh, get improvement with COVID, with uh, even the disease symptoms, with uh, whatsoever the cause, other than uh, fungal pneumonitis. Very limited uh, with fungal, limited knowledge with fungal. So I will divert question Lee, our chess team, Dr. Amarwa, Dr. Yes, and Dr. Hussam. How, how would you approach this possibility of fungal infection with COVID? Def definitely, from the uh, from the radiation, it is difficult to uh, to do that. But uh, recently, we have now uh, in Ain Shams a project with uh, one of our colleagues from the medical mycology department in Faculty of Science. So we have now algorithm, and now all the lab facilities will be soon available for such case, uh, including galactam and beta lactam and uh, beta glucan and uh, even rabbit cultures which uh, diagnose the fungus within two or three days. We can do this from sputum or lavage or even from blood. That's why it is not difficult. Uh, soon it will not be difficult to diagnose fungal infection. Please don't give uh, empirical antifungal uh, in any suspect case before doing the uh, definite uh, test. It, is, it will be available very soon, within weeks. Like uh, in clinically and radiologically, مش ماشية أو لا فنجل ما فنجل so you continue the okay. okay. yes uh, these are the ISMO clinical practice guidelines for the management of immune related pneumonitis the patient was feverish he's Feverish, he started antibiotics, did not improve within the 48 uh, hours at the start. Then prednisolone was added to treatment, as we mentioned, and then was gradually tapered, and the patient started, uh, re resumed the treatment. Uh, again, the management of grade two toxicity. Grade two toxicity, oral prednisolone, one milligram per kg per day, then start the uh, tapering. Uh, after nine months of Dervalumab, unfortunately, the patient developed progressive disease by PET CT in the form of recurrent mediastinal hyalur and newly developed right internal memory lymph nodes. 
measuring 3.3 centimeter with recurrent right lung soft tissue lesion, measuring 3.7 by 3.8 centimeters, SUV max 12.2, and newly developed subpleural tiny pulmonary nodules, the largest was at the apex, 6.5 millimeter SUV 3.8. This is the imaging of the progression at that time. The initial row is after three months of the velumab, and the next is after six, after nine months, six months later, I, I mean, showing the progression. What is the next step? What's the next step? Yeah. Uh, we don't have any data about the rest of molecular markers. EGFR, RET, MET, KERAS, ROS. Uh, the patient was initially ALK negative, uh, BDL 60%, but was by DACO staining, and EGFR uh, yeah, yeah, uh, was why? PDL1 has nothing to do. PDL1 positivity has nothing to do. If we have uh, a molecularly driven tumor, so we, we should go for the com to complete the panel initially from the start before uh, going to consider PDL1 positivity is of clinical significance. We should do the full panel, and fortunately, most of the markers are uh, done for free. So you want to order now the full molecular uh, testing? Okay, and ideally before. I'd like to have a rebiopsy. Rebiopsy? To, to do the whole, the, the full panel, yes. Okay. Is this what you've done? Uh, the patient refused rebiopsy at that time. Uh, <laughs> there was no evidence to give him IO after IO. Uh, if we review the data, uh, all the data are including uh, IO, whether uh, mono or uh, combo, but the patient previously reviewed, received IO. Uh, other recommended options are chemotherapy. The MDT decision at that time was to start the patient chemotherapy. The patient started first-line treatment, docetaxel. As there was no data I mentioned uh, to give IO after IO and no strong evidence to support platinum rechallenge. In dream CT assessment after three cycles of docetaxel showed regressive disease regarding the primary right lung lesion and stable right mediastinal and hilar lymph nodes. Naga, um, can I just ask the panel, Dr. Ala, would you have revisited the platinum option again after almost one year, particularly that it was given in a radical setting? Now, we're, yeah. Of course, I would have revisited the platinum uh, option. I mean, docetaxel, I would give as a second line, never as a first line. Um, I would have revisited the whole protocol, the pemetrexid uh, cisplatin, I would have given gemcitabin cisplatin. Uh, this is one thing. Now, the IORI challenge is quite a debatable issue here. Uh, whether we can, because again, the patient had a PDL1 that was very high. Mm. Do we have data that we can rechallenge with IO? It's been nine months. Mm. If it was six months, I would have said no way. Nine months. We, we we have ongoing clinical trial. Yeah, that's, looking at that's important. two things. Mm. Can we give CTLA four combination? Mm. This is question one. Question two: Can we reintroduce chemo with the exactly. valumab or with immunotherapy? But we are awaiting or the results. Or change the derva. Once the patient is metastatic, I wouldn't be giving derva. I would be giving uh, another type of uh, platinum based. Platinum based, and maybe I would consider Pemetrexid here. Okay. Maybe. Dr. Sharif, would you have reused L platinum? No, I don't agree with this. I think uh, we'll proceed with, uh, with monotherapy docetaxel. But why, Dr. Sharif? Why wouldn't you give? I mean, this is now the patient is metastatic. It's been nine to 10 months from the chemotherapy that he received. You are and right. he achieved a response, a very good response with the chemotherapy. I huh? do agree with this, but I mean, if uh, we looked for the uh, data, uh, especially from NCCN, we um, uh, reviewed this, uh, that docetaxel may be uh, without platinum, maybe acting more and uh, less toxicity. As a, as a first line metastatic? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you In look this at the case, first, I let, think let's, it's, let's forget uh, that the patient received that neogen. This is a metastatic patient. Your standard of care first line is a doublet that contains yes. platinum. You get the best responses but, and you uh, best get the best progression free and overall survival. Yes, but Yet if you for, look a, for IO, 
mm. because the patient received the, the start the platinum and uh, received the dorvalumab. So the data here is missing that um, uh, docetaxel without platinum is acting more than to give platinum. As a, if you consider it f a first line, maybe I am considering it as a second line. No, it's first line metastatic. And Dr. Rasha, would you give platinum or do taxanes single agent? Actually, I'm going to look for the performance status of the patient. And if the performance is permissive, let's assume it's permissive. If the patient performance status is okay, the first line of treatment for metastatic uh, stage four lung cancer patient is platinum doublet. Dr. Ahmed, تفضل إيه؟ I, before thinking of chemotherapy and immunotherapy, I don't think it is wise not to go for uh, doing the markers even on the initial biopsy. Yes, again, yes. again, even if you, you can do for circulating tumor DNA for EGFR, if the patient has EGFR mutation, which is present in up to 20% of Egyptian patients, uh, how can we go for immunotherapy or whatsoever? But if I would go for chemotherapy in a palliative setting uh, in a patient receiving a previous platinum, I would go for single agent. I have a comment. Initially, at the time of the diagnosis, the patient already underwent a complete lung panel. It was uh, negative. Uh, except ROS1. EGFR, ALK. You, you mean to repeat uh, the molecular at the time of the metastasis? Yeah. We yes, at that time, it was not available yet. These markers, at that time, the patient was treated at 20. Oh. Later on, a new biopsy was taken for the patient, yes, and yes. the markers mm -hmm. uh, complete. But initially, no. EGFR, ALK, uh, I think, intract, but no ROS, except the ROS one uh, didn't. Uh, yeah, yeah. هو طبعا ذا ديبيت از اميزنج بس في عندنا تو سيشنز بعد قبل الصلاه انا مش عارفه هنعمل ايه. النهارده ممكن نحضر السيشنز بعد الصلاه ما فيش نكمل؟ طيب دكتوره نجاح كاري اون اون اوكي Uh, the patient received the three cycles of docetaxel, uh, further three cycles, finished six cycles with progression on docetaxel. These are the images showing progression. The next step was that a new biopsy was taken for the patient and sent for foundation one test, and the patient was symptomatic, so we have started him gem cytobin carboplatin, finished at this end of January 2022. CT assessment showing progressive disease on gem, uh, gem cytobin carboplatin. And MRI brain now showed a newly developed right occipital intraaxial space occupying lesion. The patient was symptomatic and refused surgical management for this lesion, so he was sent for stereotactic radiotherapy. The foundation one result was ready at that time and showed ROS1 fusion positivity. And based on the NCCN guidelines, the patient is a candidate for uh, either uh, intractinib, uh, crizotinib, or seretinib. But intractinib is the preferred one in the brain meds. The patient started intractinib in March 22. PET CT after three months showed near CR of the bony lesions with partial response of the mediastinal and lung lesion. These are the images after three months of intractinib. The patient received further four cycles of intractinib with good tolerability and minor toxicity. The only complaint of the patient that he gained about 20 kilos in six months. The new PET CT assessment is requested and uh, still bending. My last question is what's the bone progression for this patient? He is still in a very good performance state, it's zero to one. <laughs> Stop treatment. Stop treatment. I agree for stoppage of treatment, but uh, I think lorlatinib is a is an option for Ross and uh, Alk both uh, was positive on the trial. What if the progression is a localized progression and the patient is still in a good performance status and this localized progression is amenable for local can, treatment? Can be palliative, of course. Best supportive care 
stoppage of treatment or best supportive care includes radiation therapy. Radiation therapy is a part of best supportive care. Okay. Um, these are the NCCN guidelines for those patients progressed on tractinib, crizitinib, or seretinib according to the progression. Is it symptomatic or asymptomatic? If asymptomatic, we may continue treatment or go to lorlatinib. If symptomatic, the patient is already having brain meds. If symptomatic, again, and liver uh, and limited metastasis, we may consider definitive local therapy and continue treatment. And if multiple lesions, lorlatinib, or um, to go back for systemic uh, treatment options. And uh, finally, thank you um, to all uh, Egypt Air uh, team, especially Dr. Sharif Abdel Oheb, our mentor. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nagaf. It's a pleasure having you. Uh, your presence definitely added a large value to this meeting, to this session. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Dr. Ahmed, can I just say something? First of all, I'm Dr. Iman, Chairman, and a big thank you to and Shams and congratulations on Congress. But I just want to thank you all for all of you, inshallah, in the Mu'tamar Al-Mahad from the 2 to 4 November, inshallah.